Hello, my name is Ed Breitswert. I'm the Melanie S. Steele Professor of Medicine and Infectious Diseases in the Comparative Medicine Institute at North Carolina State University College of Veterinary Medicine. In the context of disclosures, I, in conjunction with Dr. Sushama Santaki in North Carolina State University, hold a U.S. patent for methods for cultivation of microorganisms, which was issued in 2006. I am co-founder, shareholder, and chief scientific officer for Galaxy Diagnostics, a company that provides advanced diagnostic testing for the detection of Bartonella species. I do not intend to reference any off-label or non-FDA approved usage in this presentation. Our learning objectives for this module include list the major factors that influence disease expression after infection with a Bartonella species, list the strategies of frontal versus stealth pathogens, and finally, describe the histopathological progression of lesions in individuals ranging from immunocompetent to severe immunodeficiency. So, a very long time ago, Socrates stated, the beginning of wisdom is the realization of how little we really know. And as I've tried to understand the genus Bartonella, it's become increasingly obvious that we have a lot more to learn and a lot more to know. But the, the good news is, as we did not know this genus existed before 1990, we are getting a much better idea on its biomedical importance today. So one of the advantages of being a professor and having extremely bright PhD students is I was able to ask Dr. Linda Kidd, who was a PhD student in the laboratory at the time, to generate this slide for me. And the reason for that is that I want to emphasize the fact that if, if our planet is 4.6 billion years old, bacteria are believed to have been on this planet at least 3.5 billion years of that evolutionary clock. You'll see that we then end up with ticks on reptiles known to have occurred 500 million years ago, bacteria in amber in, with insects 135 million years ago, um, primitive humans starting to walk upright on the planet 6.4 million years ago. And the first tick transmitted infectious disease was actually Babesia bovis in cattle in Texas just over 100 years ago. So for clinicians, why is this important? I, I think it's important to realize that the bacteria and their respective vectors, be it a tick or a flea or a sand fly, have had a lot longer time to figure this out than we have in the 100 years that we've actually realized that um, vectors or ticks were transmitting organisms that could cause disease in animals and humans. So now focusing in specifically on the genus Bartonella in the context of um, our immune system and disease expression, Again, I would just remind you that these are alpha proteobacteria, that they have an extremely slow dividing time, that they can infect erythrocytes, which is depicted in this electron micrograph of a Bartonella hensley organism within the erythrocyte of a cat, but they can also infect many other cells within the body. So as a veterinary internist with a research background in vector-borne infectious diseases, I look at my patients and in the same way I look at this diagram. And by that, I am always thinking about what's in blood and to an extent what's in the lymphatic system that's within the body of that patient and is capable of moving throughout the body of that patient, perhaps at almost any given time. Why this is important is if we look at the other systems that are listed around blood, 
the emphasis is often, I'm a neurologist and I'm gonna look at the brain, the spinal cord, the peripheral nerves, and cerebrospinal fluid or tissues. Or if I'm a gastroenterologist, I'm really more interested in the, the intestinal tract, the gut microbiome, and what is occurring within the tube without taking too much consideration or as to whether what is in the blood could actually be influencing the intestinal microbiome as examples. So as everyone knows now, there is a microbiome on our skin that the microbiome of the armpit of different people, different sexes, different races varies. And there's a microbiome within the urinary tract, the gastrointestinal tract. But I, I think what has never been obvious, um, and we were probably somewhat misled by Robert Cook when he said he looked under his now somewhat primitive microscope and did not see bacteria, that bacteria are likely consistently in our blood and are part of a healthy blood microbiome. And what is important here, if we just briefly look at the phyla and then down to the classes, and I want you to focus on the class and buffy coat because the rid area is predominantly alpha proteobacteria. And as you'll see on the slide, in regard to overall analysis, 93% of the bacteria that have been found in blood by 16S ribosomal DNA sequencing um, are in that alpha proteobacteria group, which includes many, many bacteria, but it certainly includes the ones we're interested in in the context of Bartonella, Brucella, Rickettsia, Ehrlichia, all of which are intracellular organisms, which is, is very interesting that these investigators actually separated out buffy coat, plasma, and red blood cells, and the vast majority of the bacterial DNA was associated with the buffy coat and was associated with the alpha proteobacteria group. So factors that influence disease expression are familiar to all of us, but just as a review, organism virulence is one factor. And we generally divide organisms into those that are highly virulent, those that are of low virulence, and those that essentially have no virulence. And I think one of the comments that DDA Raul made in a meeting of the American Society of Rickettsiology is that if you take a rickettsia of low virulence and you put it into an immunocompromised patient, that rickettsia may definitely not be of low virulence anymore. So this whole idea that the host immune response and immunocompetence is a big factor in separating out these virulence characteristics. Some organisms are inherently virulent. Other organisms only become virulent if the immune system is suppressed. And then the other thing that we'll look at on a subsequent slide is the host immune responsiveness. And as an internist, I feel that there are three major things that I want my students to think about in the context of immune responsiveness. And one is the genetics of the individual patient. The second is the nutritional status of that patient. And the third is the environmental exposure to various toxins. And certainly mold would be one example, <clears throat> excuse me, that's very familiar to everyone. And then the last thing we'll touch on is polymicrobial infection. So Essentially, we've got three major factors with sub-factors that influence disease expression. So I really felt that this was a groundbreaking manuscript published by Merrill and Stanley Falco in Nature in 2004, because what they suggested is as microbiologists, diagnosticians, and clinicians, we should think of pathogens in the context of frontal pathogens or stealth pathogens. And you'll see, probably best illustrated by influenza or our current SARS coronavirus, 
that a frontal pathogen has a very short incubation time. The onset of clinical signs is relatively acute or soon after infection by the organism. There's a very rapid innate immune, immune response. So within a very short period of time, we can detect and measure antibodies. Transmission is direct, like somebody coughing into your face. Um, replication is extremely rapid. And as we know with the coronavirus, also that rapid replication and results in mutations. And carriers are relatively uncommon. So we're hoping that there's not people out there that 50, 100 days after they have this acute infection are still carrying, which we do not believe to be the case at this point. And that contact is generally has to be intimate and that oftentimes there's, if you recover, there's sterilizing immunity at that point. In contrast, the stealth pathogens have an indeterminate incubation period. And clearly with Bartonella, I think you could have been infected five years ago, 10 years ago, before you ever develop the first symptom that might be attributable to members of this genus bacteria. The, as we'll see, the clinical signs can be very chronic. It avoids elimination by the adaptive immune response. Transmission is often indirect through a vector and replication is slow. So similar to what we said earlier, 24-hour uh, replication for Bartonella versus 20 minutes for Strep, Staph, and E. coli. And the st carrier state is common. So we know from our previous modules that we've got numerous an animal species that can be chronically and non-clinically infected with Bartonella species that have co-evolved with them. And finally, vector contact is a frequent mode of transmission and um, immunity is non-sterilizing. Essentially, as we'll see on a subsequent slide, we're trying to maintain some degree of balance. So I actually soloed when I was 16 years old and I like to use um, aviation photos to illustrate this point. And so, if we consider our frontal pathogen as that F-16 fighting falcon that gets out there, gets in your face and causes problems very, very rapidly versus the B-2 stealth bomber that can essentially um, take off from California and not be detected until it gets across the Atlantic Ocean. Those are two very, very different scenarios. And the good news about the B-2 bomber, like stealth infections, is that it's essentially difficult to detect or undetectable up until that poor point in which the bomb bay doors open and things fall apart. And then we get to function as clinicians and try to figure out what's going on. So there clearly is evidence that Bartonella species are stealth pathogens and they can induce persistent infection. And I've just cherry picked a few of those to illustrate the point and using Bartonella hensilae as the organism that we're focusing on here. So an, an interesting study by uh, Dr. Dr. Galadi, who's an infectious disease physician in Israel, um, in Israel, they have a unique situation where a single laboratory confirms all the cat, cat scratch disease cases, and then individuals are put into a registry and actually followed. And when they did that, what they found was that middle-aged women, 2.9%, developed a chronic severe CSD arthropathy. And again, this is analogous to what many of you are familiar with in regard to patients that experience tick attachment, infection with Borrelia burgdorferi and chronic symptoms. And now we're seeing the same thing in regard to COVID infection with what is being referred to as COVID long haulers. And Dr. Arvand in Germany reported a child with cat scratch disease that they followed sequentially and could still PCR the organism from the blood four months later. We published on 
predominantly veterinary workers with arthropod and animal contact and were able to document through repeat BAP-GM enrichment blood cultures, persistent infection. Um, and at times this was Bartonella hensile and other times it was Bartonella hensile and Bartonella vinsoniae burkhoffi. And this was one of the earlier indications which we'll delve into in more detail in the diagnostic module that many of these individuals were not reactive to the Bartonella they were infected with. And then more frequently, which is really important because it, I think it's changing again our understanding and perspective on this entire genus, is a study by Brazilian physicians using BAP-GM enrichment blood culture that demonstrated 3.2%, essentially 16 of 500 donors in Sao Paulo, Brazil, were infected with Bartonella hensile or Bartonella clerigiae. And why I think that's important is that it's more evidence that these bacteria have evolved to induce a persistent infection in overtly healthy people that we didn't recognize, one, because we didn't know they existed, and then secondly, because we didn't, and to an extent, still do not have tests that can actually confirm that persistence. So this is a, another slide that I think is really important for us as clinicians because it's becoming increasingly obvious that intracellular bacteria, um, intracellular protozoa, and viruses are part of that iceberg that is below the surface and oftentimes as below the surface of our clinical suspicion. And the reason I say that is that it's not unusual as I've reviewed the IRB questionnaires in our studies on humans with Bartonellosis that these people will have frequently had recurrent urinary tract infections, particularly with Escherichia coli, um, or have had gallbladder infections and removal of their gallbladder. And so, you know, one of the things that is very difficult for us to understand and certainly generate evidence-based data is the extent to which these bacteria that are hiding below the surface are actually facilitating disease for bacteria that are above the surface that have sh very short dividing times and can be cultured fairly readily. Now, many people have suggested that Helicobacter pylori is a extremely important paradigm changer in medical microbiology. And why it's such an important paradigm changer is because it was one of the first examples emphasizing disease progression, if it occurred, over literally decades. So within, depending on where you live and what circumstances you live in, anywhere from 25% to 100% of people become infected with Helicobacter pylori within weeks to months of birth. And for most of these people, um, if they are scoped, they will have chronic superficial gastritis and the organism can be visualized. But they're not clinical in the vast majority of instances. They just are colonized by a bacteria that's living at a very low pH in their stomach. And yet, with years and decades of infection, we now know that Helicobacter pylori is the primary cause of peptic ulcer disease, and that elimination of the bacteria can result in resolution of the ulcer. Helicobacter also became the first example, I believe, of an antibiotic responsive lymphoma that's referred to as malt lymphoma or mucosa associated lymphoma. And ultimately, Helicobacter can predispose to gastric atrophy, and that in conjunction with mutations and inflammation can predispose to gastric adenocarcinoma. So the, the importance of Helicobacter is that it really gave us a paradigm to understand how a single bacteria that is localized to an extremely small niche, our stomach, 
can cause a diverse spectrum of disease or the lack thereof um, in the vast majority of people who are infected. Let's now consider an example of a veterinarian in a case report that was published by Dr. Marna Aronson in cl Clinical Rheumatology in 2016. Uh, this veterinarian was diagnosed with cat scratch disease in 1960 and was seen by a cardiologist in 1983, a gastroenterologist in 1986, a endocrinologist in 2006, a neurologist in 2005, a dermatologist in 2009, and kind of the list goes on until um, a rheumatologist through 2014 and ultimately developed very rapid and progressive deterioration of the right hip joint secondary to osteoarthritis. In April of 2015, she was actually tested at Galaxy Diagnostics for Bartonella and was PCR positive and IFA seroreactive. At that point, um, they did a very extensive workup, including a abdominal CT and thoracic CT and documented that she had mild pericardial effusion um, and these hepatic masses. On August 15th, she had surgery and her right hip was replaced, which we'll see on the next slide. And what you can see here is that we've got a new hip and she had agreed, her infectious disease physician and her surgeon, that the femoral head, once removed, would be driven directly from Duke University where the surgery occurred to NC State where Nande Nandu Balakrishnan in my laboratory set up multiple, multiple cultures from inside the bone, outside the bone, synovial fluid, um, and some of the synovial capsule tissue. And what you can see in the microbiological results here is that initially she was actually documented to be infected with a BAPGM enrichment blood culture, but she was negative from her blood, negative from seven days, negative from 14 days, and the bacterial DNA was amplified on day 21. In regard to her femoral head, we were able prior to enrichment to take samples and PCR Bartonella hensilae directly from the femoral head. And for, to avoid any question in regard to contamination, these were only tested at the endpoint of 21 days. And although we only show a few here, this was four different um, cultures, all of which yielded Bartonella hensilae the synovial fluid may have become positive, but it was clearly negative at 21 days. And it was also negative by direct PCR, direct DNA extraction and PCR. And then the synovial capsule was positive. My prediction based on some other things that we've seen, which are very limited, is that this joint fluid was perhaps negative and pr probably because Bartonella preferentially infects the tissues of the joint capsule and the connective tissues and ligaments that surround the joint and is not um, always in the joint in quantities or the joint fluid inhibits its growth. What we're starting to see in regard to Bartonella and the joint is the fact that the organism is in higher concentration in the tissues surrounding the joint as compared to um, actually being within the joint fluid itself. And in these slides, Dr. Aronson is demonstrating being able to light up the organism um, within bone, which is quite an accomplishment. And here she's using a totally different approach that does not have a uh, antibody directed at the organism. Um, this is called a multi-photon image that allows you to actually see the bacteria by shooting photons through the bone. 
So when I think of my patients and an infectious disease, I always try to assess those with a chronic illness in the context of immunological balance and disease expression. And as we mentioned earlier, genetics, nutrition, and toxicity are on the three corners of my infectious disease triangle. Genetics may predict how we come into this world is to an extent how we will go out of the world. But we can certainly modify this by exposure to environmental toxins, by smoking cigarettes, by drinking an excessive amount of alcohol. And we clearly know that those people that die of malnutrition often die of infectious diseases. So clearly, excessive nutrition and undernutrition both can influence this triangle. And then what I envision is this balance, as we'll see on the next slide, between health and disease. And I put over here immune suppression, a question mark, because therapeutically, I, as some other physicians, believe that we treat a lot of autoimmune and immune-mediated diseases with immunosuppressive drugs that are within individuals having occult infection with highly variable outcomes. So if one of these children represented health and the other one represented disease, as long as this teeter-totter is in this position, everything is in balance. But if one of these children step off of that teeter-totter, then we are no longer in balance and disease expression occurs. And we as physicians and veterinary, veterinarians have to figure out why. So I want to use four examples, um, three from our experience and then one from the a publication in the New England Journal of Medicine to illustrate the same organism, Bartonella hensilae, potentially different strains of this organism, which could expect, explain some degree of differences in virulence. But in this instance, we're going to go from a very young individual to an older individual, to a renal transplant patient, to an individual with HIV who is extremely or severely compromised in regard to their disease. And their, their diagnoses are going to vary from mild cat scratch disease to very severe and somewhat atypical cat scratch disease um, to a protracted severe course of illness in an immunocompromised transplant recipient to bacillary angiomatosis. <clears throat> so this story in regard to the first two individuals starts with a cat named Squirt. And Squirt was rescued by his owners, <clears throat> had a miliary dermatitis and not a military dermatitis and generalized lymphadenopathy. Um, blood count, serum biochemical profile and urine analysis by the veterinarian that was done at that, the time the cat was adopted was normal <clears throat> except for a very profound eosinophilia, which was associated with the flea infestation um, and the skin lesions. Interestingly, when we infected cats with blood containing Bartonella hensilae, those cats developed a relapsing eosinophilia as they also developed a relapsing bacteremia. And the other thing that was interesting that was not understood is this nonspecific encephalopathy that squirt experience where he would become somewhat incoordinated and then within minutes was fine, or he didn't seem to be as responsive as he should have been and was staring off into space, which again is something that we've seen in a research setting um, when we've experimentally infected cats by blood transfusion. So the first individual is Tommy, who has the very mild case of cat scratch disease. At the time this occurred, um, Tommy had adopted Squirt, 13 years old, and developed just 
classical cat scratch disease, fever and lymphadenopathy, um, a scratch on the hand and occurred in the neck, but he also had a distant lymph node in his groin that became quite enlarged. He never missed school, never got really sick, and within six weeks, the lymphadenopathy had resolved and he was not treated with antibiotics. So essentially what we would expect as clinicians for classical cat scratch disease in a very healthy immunocompetent individual self-limiting illness. And this is Tommy I am using his photograph with permission. And I am pretty sure if I would have told him that I was going to take his picture that day, he'd have worn a different shirt. So I want you to contrast Tommy with Tommy's dad, who was scratched by the same kitten and presumably infected with the same Bartonella hensley strain. So Tom, like many older fathers, had a lot of responsibility, a job. He was the Boy Scout camp leader, and he had actually taken his entire troop on a camping trip, after which he came home and he got sick. He had been scratched um, several weeks before this camping trip, and I'll show you that on the next slide, but he developed the typical inoculation papule in his leg, and Tom really didn't like cats, and he'd only gotten a squirt because Tommy wanted a cat. But what's very interesting is he really had almost no contact with this young cat, except for when he came home from work and the cat scratched him in, in the leg. And so what's very different is he was ultimately hospitalized with a severe flu-like illness, required some intravenous fluids, and lost seven pounds of body weight in during his course of illness. Now, one thing I think we can all agree on is this gentleman does, is not an individual that needed to lose seven pounds of body weight. And this is the inoculation papule almost eight weeks after Squirt made that claw mark through his pants leg. And based on studies done in Europe where they've actually biopsied these lesions, um, they, with Worth and Starry stain, would contain bacteria, Bartonella hensley, and would be PCR positive. So this is Renee, and Renee's story was published in Clinical Infectious Diseases because when this picture was taken, she had had three renal transplants. And she initially developed fever of unknown origin and thought that it was rejection of her third transplant. That was proven not to be the case and her fevers resolved. Over the next several months, she developed um, chronic diarrhea that was worked up and no true etiology was found. And then a few months after that, she started with respiratory symptoms and a cough that was relatively non-productive. This is the CT scan. And again, this is the publication by Miguel Caniza in CID in 1995, um, when Renee was a patient at Duke University and seen by a pediatric ID physician. And, and what you can see is a, a lot of nodules, obviously very bothersome, um, in any patient, but particularly a patient that is immunocompromised um, to prevent rejection of her kidneys. And after a very thorough workup, all of which was negative for mycobacteria, pneumocystis, and other things, um, a, the surgeons ended up having to go in and obtain a biopsy. And what you can see is these kind of nodular areas within the lungs that are pyogranulomatous pneumonitis. And special stains were negative, and honestly, everyone was still at a loss as to what was going on. Um, and in Dr. Ken Wilson's laboratory at that point in time, uh, a eubacterial PCR was performed and Bartonella hensley was amplified and sequenced out of these tissues.
And it was only after that that we found out that Renee's mom was the local cat lady and that the family had a large number of cats that they maintained as pets, including on Renee's bid, as well as a transient population of flea-infested cats that would be left on the doorstep. But the very interesting thing about the lesions in most patients with bacillary angiomatosis, and certainly in Renee, is that these must be a relatively low virulence Bartonella henselae strains because they respond extremely well to doxycycline, which was used in this case um, with total resolution of those granulomatous lesions and resolution of our symptoms. So our, our last example is what we've used in a previous module from David Relman's work where he amplified um, either Bartonella henselae or Bartonella quintana from humans with uh, HIV or filiosis hepatis, which to date is only associated with Bartonella henselae, again in patients that are generally immunocompromised by um, the retrovirus or by transplant, transplant recipients. So this is a slide to kind of summarize everything that we just discussed in regard to disease expression. And I, if, if we look on here, the extent of disease related to the progression in immunodeficiency, so from not being immunodeficient to being very severely immunodeficient, and then the changes in the histopathology that a pathologist would see related to the progression in immunodeficiency. So, Clearly, the vast majority of individuals that are infected with a Bartonella species likely have no symptoms and the organism is eliminated at the inoculation site. So perhaps um, others would only develop a very focal granuloma. So our essentially classical cat scratch disease granuloma but not even progress to having um, lymphadenopathy. Then we get into our group that has classical cat scratch disease and with regional granulomas or necrotizing lymphadenitis. And then the next group would be down here, um, which is Renee and probably a few others that develop granulomatous disease. So as we talked about in the um, pathology module, Bartonella is a well-recognized cause of granulomatous lymphadenitis, granulomatous hepatitis, um, and probably granulomatous inflammation within other tissues. And then this would be the patient that only has localized bacillary angiomatosis um, diffuse bacillary angiomatosis and systemic bacillary angiomatosis, depending on the severity of the immunocompromise. So there is a spectrum of Bartonella associated illness that is far broader than was previously recognized. And that spectrum regrettably, because it's so broad, falls into three major buckets. One would be neurological disease, one would be rheumatological disease, and the other would be cardiovascular disease with endocarditis, myocarditis, and perhaps, which is less well studied and characterized, vasculitis, thromboembolism, and aneurysms that may all ultimately in selected patients be associated with Bartonella. And again, this is supported by these references, which predominantly come from our laboratory because I think we were the first and remain among the few that are trying to understand the role of these bacteria in regard to persistent infection and chronic disease expression. So the, the last part or puzzle, piece to the puzzle in regard to disease expression is polymicrobial infections. 
And in this instance, I perhaps have an advantage and a disadvantage as a veterinarian, because if we use dogs as an example, it's very hard to walk a Labrador retriever down a road or a pathway without them running into the bushes, running into the woods, and therefore their exposure to vectors is generally far greater than the owner's exposure or human exposure to the same vectors within the same environment. And I'm gonna use two examples that one involves dogs and tied up our research laboratory for almost a year trying to sort this little kennel out. And the other involves a veterinarian that ends up infected with um, two organisms that had never been found before in a human. And the reason these organisms were found is because the techniques that we had developed for dogs, essentially molecular microbiological diagnostic techniques developed for dogs, have applicability for human illness. And so this is a true story. Uh, Hound Lat Alley Lane is actually a location. Obviously, it is very rural in North Carolina. And this was a kennel of walker hounds, uh, essentially deer hounds used for hunting. And it was very obvious that these owners loved their hounds, that they perhaps valued these dogs more than they did their spouses. But what they didn't understand was that vectors could transmit a spectrum of organisms and that their dogs had a spectrum of vectors, including several tick species, cat fleas, Tenosophilus felis, which also infests dogs, as we've talked about in previous modules, and human body lice, which I haven't quite figured out just yet, but we find them infesting dogs every once in a while. So the bottom line, this is actually PCR results from these 27 dogs. We were able to PCR amplify Ehrlichia canis, Ehrlichia chaffiensis. So this is a brown dog tick. This is the Lone Star tick. This is the Lone Star tick. This was likely all anaplasma platus because after this, we figured out that if there was a very, very large quantity of anaplasma platus, it would come up positive with our anaplasma phagsis tophilum primers. This was likely Rickettsia felis, but when we did this study, we weren't big enough, smart enough, or good enough to sort this out, which I think we are now. You'll see that 16 dogs were infected with either Bartonella hensile or Bartonella vinsonii burkhoffi and seven were infected with a Babesia that's transmitted by the same tick that transmits Ehrlichia canis or Babesia canis. And so, again, from one of these dogs and a single EDTA blood sample, we were able to identify six different organisms in four different genera. That, again, is why I mentioned that it's perhaps an advantage and a disadvantage to be a veterinarian trying to understand vector-borne disease infection um, in my canine and feline patients. But what it did teach me very well is that a dog that comes in that's PCR positive for this combination is going to look very different clinically in regard to disease expression to this dog that has this combination or this dog that has this combination. So clearly polymicrobial infection plays a very big role. And this is a slide that was generated by my research colleague, Dr. Ricardo Maggi. And, and I think again, what Ricardo was trying to demonstrate is what we believe as a laboratory, that there is a microbiome that and multiple microbiomes uh, within the human body. There are toxins that we're all exposed to, and some people are exposed to more than others. Nutrition and lifestyle decisions influence this ba balance. Genetics influences this balance. And we believe that intracellular organisms are the major component of the pathobiome that can throw this entire balance um, out of whack. So I'll 
I began with, began with Socrates and with some trepidation, I'll end with Voltaire. His comment, every man is a creature of the age in which he lives, and few are able to raise themselves above the ideas of the time. And I think one of the ideas that we need to come to grips with is chronic illnesses, complex disease expression, and vector-borne infections deserve a substantial amount of attention now and by future generations. So to conclude, I hope I have emphasized that chronic bloodstream infection is the norm in reservoir hosts, but it certainly occurs in a subset of accidentally infected hosts. Intracellular organisms have developed immune evasive strategies so they can persist within cells of the host for very long periods of time. In each patient, disease expression is determined by unique genetic, nutritional, and environmental factors. And finally, I hope we've emphasized that immune competence varies amongst individuals and is an important factor in disease expression. And with that, again, I would like to thank all the people who have helped generate data in our laboratory um, in regard to Bartonella and other vector-borne organisms. And I hope that something that I've said will be a benefit to you when you're next standing across a table from your patient. And with that, these are the references that were cited in this module. And thank you very much.